Hi, my name is J.R. Martin. I'm the author of Selling Us Out. I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak to you about what we can do together to rebuild and revitalize the U.S. economy. This is my passion and what my book, Selling Us Out, is all about. To set the tone for this discussion, I'd like to take a moment and read these two quotes from our first two presidents. George Washington said in his farewell address to the nation, However political parties may now and then answer popular ends, they are likely in the course of time and things to become potent engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power of the people and to usurp for themselves the reins of government, destroying afterward the very engines which have lifted them to unjust dominion. And John Adams counseled us, there is nothing which I dread so much as the division of the Republic into two great parties, each arranged under its leader, and concerning measures in opposition to each other. This, in my humble apprehension, is to be dreaded as the greatest political evil under our Constitution. As we go through this presentation, I ask that you set aside partisan thoughts, partisan politics. Open up your minds your ears, and your hearts, and listen to what I'm about to share with you with American ears and heart. But we will insist on trade that is fair and free. We are always willing to be trade partners, but never trade patsies. There's always been a way we've done things in this country. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, distinguished members of the Congress, Honored guests and fellow citizens. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, distinguished members of Congress, honored guests and fellow citizens. Traditions. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, members of Congress, distinguished guests, and fellow Americans. We know what we expect to hear. We've been creating millions of new jobs. Nearly 160,000 jobs. 20 million jobs. 1.6 million. 4.6 million. 2 million. 6 million. And 2.3 million new jobs. But what is being said and what is happening are two very different things. Good jobs depend on expanded trade. Selling in a new The information, market, new jobs. the policies. Years ago, I set a goal of doubling. U.S. exports over five years. With open markets and a level playing field, no one can outproduce or outcompete the American Years market. of data and research being filtered and fed by those in power. Signed into law. We're on track to meet that goal ahead of schedule. With NAFTA, with GATT, with our efforts in Asia and the national export Soon strategy, there will be new cars on the streets America of Seoul is selling imported its cars from Detroit and, and Toledo and Chicago. Since 1970, it is the blind being led by those who cannot see. We turn the budget deficit to house and America keep surfaces. America on track for a surplus we will double in 2012. Our exports over the next five years. Our deficit the is projected to be two million jobs in America. The budget billion dollars balance. Because the more products we make and sell to other countries, the more jobs we support right here in America. This is an extraordinary period for America's economy. It's just not working. My name is J.R. Martin, and I am not okay with that. Did you notice anything mentioned there about trade deficits? They weren't edited out. In fact, neither our political establishment nor the news media ever discusses trade deficits. It's as if they either don't matter or don't exist. From 1975 until current time, our country has run nothing but trade deficits. In fact, it's the fastest growing and largest trade deficits in the world. No other nation has exported its wealth at this rate and survived, and neither will the United States unless we quickly change course. In contrast, our national debt is discussed continually by the political establishment and our media. However, 
What's not discussed is how much of this debt is foreign owned. Almost 50% with our number one lender being Communist China. It can be said that the Communist Chinese Party is fulfilling the prophecy of Lenin, in which he said, the capitalists will sell us the rope with which we will hang them. While America sleeps, the Communist Chinese are destroying our country from within, buying up U.S. companies, real estate, and other strategic assets at a record rate, with our help and with our money. Now let's take a look at how the U.S. national debt tracks with our trading balance. As you can see, the two track very closely. Why is that? It's because when you send factories and jobs offshore, along with that goes the tax base. We cannot fix the national debt without fixing the trade imbalance first. Having arguments about fixing the national debt without fixing the trade imbalance is having an endless argument about how to redivide a shrinking pie without understanding or addressing why the pie is shrinking. We must urgently work to fix our trade imbalance, to rebuild the U.S. economy. This is the core of my presentation and what my book, Selling Us Out, is all about. Okay, now for some quick facts. Since 2001, the U.S. economy has exported over $8 trillion in wealth, and we continue to export roughly $600 billion a year. In 2007, China had the world's largest trade surplus, while the U.S. had the world's largest trade deficit. To put this in perspective, out of 196 nations, the U.S. was 196th. Turkey was 195th. Their trade deficit was one-tenth of ours. Think about that. This means that economically, we're headed for a place worse off than Turkey. 2.8 million jobs have been lost to China since 2001. Of these, 800,000 jobs were in computer manufacturing. According to a study that I cite in my book, Selling Us Out, for every computer manufacturing job lost in the U.S. economy, 15 other good jobs, high-paying jobs with benefits are eliminated. That's 12 million total jobs lost. Almost 700,000 jobs have been lost to Mexico due to NAFTA. If you remember when Bill Clinton signed NAFTA, that was initiated by Bush Sr., it was said that NAFTA was going to be a net job creator, and it was going to generate surpluses or increase our surplus that was then in existence with Mexico. Neither has happened. In fact, we turned a $1.6 billion trade surplus with Mexico into almost a $100 million trade deficit. That $1.6 billion surplus supported 29,000 U.S. jobs, most of which were in manufacturing with good pay and benefits. We've wiped not only those 29,000 out, but an additional almost 700,000 jobs. The average tariff rate in the United States is 1.3%, with the majority of products coming in tariff-free. I guarantee you, having traveled around the world and done business around the world, there is no other country where you'll find conditions like this to move product in. Why has this been done? Because domestic and foreign corporations have rigged our system through their lobbyists to allow the production of product other places to ship into the U.S. tariff and tax-free to increase their profits. This isn't trade. This is the looting and bankrupting of the American economy. While China builds new factories and fills them with their engineers, we are demolishing U.S. factories along with the U.S. economy. send their child to school for engineering, or why would any student of age pursue a degree in engineering when we're blowing up buildings in the U.S. that house engineers? The reason we don't have more engineers isn't because we don't have students that aren't capable of pursuing engineering degrees. Parents and students in our country see the value that we place on engineering and see that these jobs are being outsourced 
and they're making a conscious decision to pursue other types of education in lieu of engineering. This is not just an opinion, this is a matter of fact. I have many former colleagues and friends that are engineers themselves that have counseled their children not to pursue engineering educations for the reasons I just stated. So how did we get here? To understand how we got to where we're at today, you have to go back and look at our history. Prior to 1913, the federal government was primarily funded using tariffs. Tariff rates at some points were as high as 80%. In 1910, the average tariff rate was at 40%. We had a national debt of $2.6 billion, which was really insignificant, but 100% of that debt was American-owned. Fast forward to 1950, you'll see tariff rates at 12%. You'll see that the income tax worked better than anyone had anticipated. It's fairly evenly balanced. You'll notice that the contribution by individual, as well as corporations, was fairly evenly split. And also there was quite a large portion of uh, revenue still coming in through excise taxes. In tariffs now, as far as total contribution, even though the rates are 12%, have become a relatively small contributor. Now let's look at 2010. In 2010, you can see a much different picture has emerged. Our national debt is at 14 trillion and growing approximately $1 trillion or more a year. And as we talked about earlier, almost 50% of it is foreign owned with communist China being the number one lender. Our tariff system is basically non-existent at a 1.3% average tariff rate and a majority of goods coming into this country tariff free. Also, you notice that the percentage of taxes paid by corporations is the lowest that it's been in the history of the income tax. And the opposite is true for individuals, especially when you take in consideration Social Security tax paid in as well as individual income tax. And finally, you'll see that the excise tax is pretty much non-existence. Both the corporate income tax and the excise tax has been virtually eliminated through the lobbying efforts of both foreign and domestic corporations. The fact is that corporations are paying amongst the lowest effective tax rate in the world. And their contribution into the U.S. Treasury is the lowest that it's ever been on a percentage basis in the history of income tax. So the impact of all this is obviously that federal spending in 2010 was at $3.6 trillion. Revenue taken in was at $2.2 trillion. And we borrowed the difference. We've been doing this consecutively for years now, and that's why our national debt is skyrocketing. So why did this happen? As they say, follow the money. In 1976, a total of $182 million was spent on fe all federal elections versus $5.3 billion spent in 2008. The money was pretty evenly split between both Democrats and Republicans. Just look at the amount of money spent in the presidential cycle in 2008 and compare that to 2006. The source of this money is primarily from the financial sector of our economy, as detailed in the charts that are shown in my book. The pattern is the same for both President Obama and John McCain. Basically, the same sources of money are contributing to both sides of the presidential campaign as well as the Congress. Here's the same information for the 2010 House and Senate campaigns. As you can see, as in the presidential campaigns, the financial industry are the top contributors, with donations being evenly split between Democrats and Republicans, clearly hedging their bets so that no matter who gets elected, they have direct influence and control. So what's been the impact? The most significant impact has been the dismantling and destruction of our production and manufacturing base. We have fewer people in the United States working in manufacturing than we had in 1941. Even though our population has more than tripled, the financial industry which used to be in a support role to the production side of the economy, has overtaken 
and is aggressively dismantling the production side of our economy simply for the sake of profit. Let's go back and revisit this chart and notice the escalation of our national debt and our trade deficits in the negative direction both occur around the same time as this crossover point between the financial industry and manufacturing in the 1980s. That's no coincidence. The financial industry, that's when they started making huge profits, rigging our systems for outsourcing and offshoring of products and resale in the U.S., which drove this massive trade deficit that we now have. We destroyed our tax base, and spending kept going, and that's what created the debt, as we talked about earlier. The financial industry is making money both ways. They're making money through the offshoring and outsourcing of product in factories and resale in the U.S., as well as financing the escalating debt. And that's why that industry is doing so much better, and that's why the manufacturing sector is in so much decline. So what's been the impact? The middle class is in retreat, and it's in the worst shape that it's been since World War II. Meanwhile, the top 1% of our population, the wealthiest among us, are profiting handsomely from the activities that have gone on in our economy since the early 1980s. Again, it's no coincidence that the concentration of wealth that's shown on this chart accelerated greatly, began and accelerated greatly through the 1980s, which again correlates with when the trade deficits and the national debt started accelerating. This is all linked to the financial industry. And also it's no coincidence that executive compensation from the 1980s until now has skyrocketed in relationship to the average workers. And this is because the executives, especially CEOs of these corporations that are creating huge profits to the folks on Wall Street for outsourcing and offshoring, are getting compensated in stock options and other forms of compensation in large numbers because of the uh, dismantling of the U.S. economy, their role in helping accelerate and drive that. The things that will destroy America are prosperity at any price, peace at any price, safety first instead of duty first, and the love of soft living, and the get-rich-quick theory of life. Do you think that his words are being fulfilled? So the, our government sends out these monthly jobs reports that actually are very misleading because people have a sense that things are getting better than they really are. And why is that? It's because those reports give gross numbers, but they don't say what types of jobs are being created. The jobs that are being created in our economy, the majority of them, are low-income jobs with low pay and no benefits. Actually, I saw an article recently in one of the major newspapers that called them Mick Jobs. And that's precisely what they are. As this data clearly shows, Middle income and high income jobs are disappearing from the U.S. economy. Low income jobs are rapidly increasing. Government jobs for now are flat, but that, as we all know, is unsustainable because, as we discussed earlier, a third of the money that the federal government is spending is borrowed money. That's not going to last forever. We all know that. Not only is the federal government borrowing money, but it's also supplying, subsidizing, state and local governments so that they can continue to support their payrolls. What happens when the federal government is no longer able to borrow money at the rate that it's borrowing and is no longer able to provide the money to subsidize state and local governments? We need to stop playing politics with the lives of our citizens and face the facts. It's only when we face the facts and the reality of our situation that we can start to improve it. I can personally attest to these facts. There are many, many people in our economy that are either unemployed or underemployed, not because of lack of education or they don't have the right education, but simply because we've created a structural problem in our economy through offshoring and outsourcing, that the jobs that they've been trained to do no longer exist. They've been sent to somewhere else in the world, Taiwan, India, China. I also have many former colleagues and friends in similar situations. In fact, there was an article that I wrote last year about an incident at Harley-Davidson in Milwaukee where they laid off a third of their IT staff, American workers, and immediately replaced them 
with workers from India on H-1B visas. They told these workers, as they let them go, that if they wanted to receive any severance pay, they had to agree to stay and train the replacement workers from India. This is the abuse of the so-called immigration system that we have, and it's only going to get worse even with the new immigration bill that's being proposed. In fact, the new immigration bill that's being proposed expands the number of H-1B visas and L-1 visas, these special visas that allow companies to bring foreign workers into the U.S. Those numbers will be greatly expanded under this new immigration bill. While we face many challenges, the good news is these are all fixable. The solutions to these challenges are discussed throughout my book and summarized in the final chapter. I will now give you a brief overview. In 1912, in a speech that Theodore Roosevelt gave uh, called the Progressive Covenant with the People, he said the following, Political parties exist to secure responsible government and to execute the will of the people. From these great tasks, both of the old parties have turned aside. Instead of instruments to promote the general welfare, they have become the tools of corrupt interests, which use them impartially to serve their selfish purposes. Behind the ostensible government sits enthroned an invisible government owing no allegiance and acknowledging no responsibility to the people. To destroy this invisible government, to dissolve the unholy alliance between corrupt business and corrupt politics, is the first task of the statesmanship of the day. Ironically, the challenges that Theodore Roosevelt faced in his time are the same challenges that we face today. This is because, while technology changes, human nature is constant. Those who are ignorant of history, especially American history, are doomed to repeat it. We need to open up and clean up our political process so that the best and brightest and amongst us can be elected. It's a tragic irony that if Washington and Adams were alive today, Neither, neither could be elected to public office. Why? Because Washington refused to align himself with any political party. He was a nonpartisan. In today's vernacular, he was an independent. Adams was much the same. He loosely affiliated with the party of his time, but he refused to compromise his principles and who he was. Therefore, it's highly likely that if Adams were alive today, because of his refusal to compromise his principles, that he would not receive the endorsement of any major political party. How many Adams and Washingtons do we have amongst us today that we cannot elect to office because of our corrupt, dysfunctional political system? Nothing that I talked about today gets fixed until we first fix our politics. This is the first and most important task that we must complete and upon which everything depends. So how do we do this? Well, I find it interesting that at the founding of the country, one of the founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, advocated for term limits. His exact words were, to prevent every danger which might arise to American freedom from continuing too long in office, it is earnestly recommended that we set an obligation on the holder of that office to go out after a certain period. What I propose is six terms for House members and two terms for Senators. If we have term limits for the President, why doesn't it make sense to have term limits for Congress? Public financing and elections ban all donations. We need a public system to finance our election campaigns. Private money introduces private corruption. Eradicate professional lobbying and influence peddling. With universities, professional organizations, the internet, and other easy to access sources of information today, there's no need for lobbyists. And actually, think of the positive benefit that these bright, young, intelligent people could add to our economy if their efforts are put back into the private sector instead of the public sector. We urgently need to create a national economic strategy. Of all the things that I talk about in my book, I feel that this is probably the most important and most urgent. 
We're competing against other countries that I talk about in my book that have strategies and have had them for many years and are executing very well against us. We have no strategy. We have political ideology. This national economic strategy needs to be comprised of public and private partnerships and consortiums, which I discuss in more detail in my book. We need to invest in not just physical infrastructure in our country, but also digital infrastructure. We should have fiber optic everywhere. Just think of the intellectual ingenuity that will be unleashed if every home in America is able to access a op fiber optic network. Broadband needs to be everywhere. This is the infrastructure, the information highway of the 21st century. It needs to be readily available and accessed everywhere. We need to have restrictions on foreign ownership of U.S. corporations. These restrictions need to be a mirror image of the same restrictions that our companies are subject to in other countries. Banking and financial reforms. We need to update and reinstate Glass-Steagall and repeal Graham Leach, Bliley, and Dodd-Frank. We need sensible tax reform. Tax reform that's driven by pragmatism and not ideology. And again, this is discussed in detail in Selling Us Out. We need to replace free trade with reciprocal trade. Reciprocal trade is mutually beneficial trade that extends the same terms that we receive. Nothing more, nothing less. Instead of asking our trading partners for a level playing field, we need to create one and enforce it. We need to withdraw from the WTO, North American Free Trade Agreement, and all other such free trade agreements. We need to immediately stop any new free trade agreements, such as Trans-Pacific Partnership, otherwise known as TPP, as well as the proposed European Free Trade Agreement. We need to use tariffs and other instruments such as a value-added tax to offset the effects of currency manipulation and other trade-distorting practices. We need to make the well-being of American workers and families the prime consideration when formulating all of our economic and trade policies. That's a direct quote from a speech that Theodore Roosevelt gave during his time that's as relevant today as it was then. And we need to unleash the power of Yankee ingenuity and innovation. However, it's not enough just to create intellectual property. We also need to protect it and make sure that any intellectual property that we create is used first and foremost to the benefit of the U.S. economy, U.S. families, and U.S. workers to rebuilding and revitalizing American industry and economy. You know, the good news is as Alex de Tocqueville reminded us, the greatness of America lies not in being more enlightened than any other nation, but rather in our ability to repair our faults. That's the beauty. And why is that true? Because we have freedom. We have freedom to choose what course we take as individuals and as a nation. And as long as we have that freedom, every day is a new day. That's the American optimism, that's the American spirit, and that's why I have no doubt that together we can overcome the problems that we face. We face great challenges, but I know that working together there is nothing we Americans cannot accomplish. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation today. To learn more about me and my book, please visit sellingusout.org.